Imagine, just imagine putting your child to bed at night and knowing that despite all of your efforts, your child is not safe. I'm Polly Perrette. Join me as we investigate the threat that is destroying a continent and the extraordinary efforts to catch a killer in the dark. Life on the African continent, its exquisite beauty, the symmetry of new beginnings, and primal passings. This is Africa's rhythm, its texture, and across the land, its formidable realities. We don't all fall sick on the same day, but today is this person, tomorrow's another one. Malaria kills more than one million people each year. Every 45 seconds, a child in Africa dies of malaria. This is an extraordinary effort to catch a killer in the dark. Each evening as the sun sets, a killer emerges, or rather a swarm of killers mosquitoes. Their bites will likely infect most of these villagers with malaria sometime in their lives. And far too many will not survive the attack. When the moon feigns a wink over the village of Ticanco, just outside the city of Bo, Sierra Leone, it signals the end of the day's searing heat and the start of the night's comfortable camaraderie. My name is Paramount Chief Joe Kambay Makabure. First, the main news in detail. In this rural community, Chief Makabure's radio is a prized possession. President Obama has said it's a connection to the outside world. But despite their interest in what's happening elsewhere, most of these villagers only recently learned that mosquitoes cause malaria even though it results in one of the main reasons people are dying in this developing nation. When people became feverish and died, none of us knew why. It was some disease about which we knew nothing. Fact is, in this area of Africa, most deaths in children under the age of five are caused by malaria. An educational campaign has begun to take hold. And now, the mosquito has become a feared adversary. The mosquitoes are as old as we are, and they are everywhere. When they bite us, they bite the father, the mother, the children. We don't have medication for them. Then you die. So that is why we call it the killer's disease. <laughs> But tonight, Hawa Berry has a defense against the mosquito, a long-lasting insecticide-treated bed net. The children settle in for the night, as do the chickens. And Hawa breathes a little easier, knowing that her babies are less likely to contract malaria. In fact, it cuts their chances by half. This bedtime routine is new to the family, and to most everyone else in the village. It took an unprecedented effort to make the nets available to everyone. This is a day of celebration, because mosquito nets will soon hang in the homes of over half a million people in the Bow District. The campaign is the first of its kind, not because bed nets are being distributed, but because of the tremendous grassroots effort that has gone into making this happen. This community is achieving for itself what outside organizations could not. When the people have ownership, they are destined to succeed. We went from village to village and talked to them the importance of the bed nets. And malaria, you know, kills. So we have told them that that is the difference. We want to prevent. Prevention is better than cure. The difference is the 3,700 local volunteers trained to go house to house to educate, assist, and later, return to see how the nets are being used. 
It's a far cry from simply handing out nets, which are sometimes resold, misused, or not used at all. Sometimes people go to the bushes uh, to fishing, fishing with the nets, and uh, we try to educate them not to do that. Then again, they use it as a shower cap. They cover their heads with it. Compared to the larger charities addressing malaria on a global level, this is a relatively modest troop of faith-based advocates. And they are sparking a revolution that is genuinely showing results. Before you go into their houses, most of them have started hanging up their, their, their bed nets. <laughs> The United Methodist Church's Imagine No Malaria initiative partnered with like-minded organizations, the government of Sierra Leone, and religious leaders in the district. But with so many players, it was not easy. God is so good. Later on in the program, what it takes to cloak a community in bed nets. In the 19th century, malaria earned West Africa the nickname, the White Man's Grave. In reality, the disease has always been colorblind. Across the entire continent, burial grounds are populated with its victims, leaving behind shattered families and broken hearts. The most vulnerable are pregnant women and children but no one is safe from the mosquito's kiss of death. That's why volunteers like Lapia Amara are making house calls. The United Methodist Church organized and trained local Christian and Muslim health workers who were responsible for educating residents. You put it this way, so the mosquito will not enter through the nets. And providing each household with long-lasting insecticide-treated bed nets. You do this one now. When I go to house to house, some people don't allow people just to enter into their bedrooms. I can talk to them not to be afraid because we are here to help. By that, they will allow you to enter into their bedrooms and you hand the net. Because mosquitoes largely feed at night, bed nets are a practical defense against the insects. Lapia visits a mother who just gave birth to a baby girl this morning. Bantu Kamara has lost two children to what she calls warm body, high fever that is indicative of malaria. These nets will be aired out for a day and then the family will have some protection. But even though a net may drape the bed, just feet away, mosquitoes breed in standing water. I don't feel happy seeing this dirty water over here. This is a dirty water where the mosquito will bleed. You can see the egg in the water. If you don't have mosquito nets, you will get sick with malaria. Over there, the banana tree is not good, not properly clean, so that the mosquitoes will not settle around this place. And even if you watch over there, the potato greens is not correct. You can see so many plastic over there. And I believe before I leave from here, I will talk to them so that they can just clean this place so that everything will be all right for them. Taking the extra step is the foundation of this approach. We are understanding the reality that one net is just not enough for the family. Shannon Trilly is part of the team that's stressing a community-based solution. She says it takes local and governmental support. I think the assumption of the government is that uh, the UMC uh, comes in as a donor and we leave a lot of money and then we go home. So very quickly the conversation comes uh, that we're a different kind of partner in which we're both a donor and an implementing partner. The training of community health workers stresses accountability and the governance of funds and resources. We're not just coming with a free item and leaving. The community is responsible for meeting us halfway and their responsibility is, is very much explained before these bales of nets arrive. This faith-based approach is intended to create new systems and new ways of achieving the common goal of better health. I'm just going to wrap it and put one knot. 
Gary Henderson heads the church's global health initiative. He says that addressing diseases of poverty is the only goal here. It's that simple. There is no hidden agenda with imaginal malaria. Imaginal malaria is about saving lives. It is about addressing the diseases of poverty. Be they Christian, Muslim, traditional African religion, people have learned through experience that we can be trusted in that way. It involves hundreds of thousands of bed nets, educational campaigns, but most of all, community empowerment. Stay tuned to see why Neighbor to Neighbor is the way to go. Faith-based organizations provide anywhere between 40 and 60 percent of the health care in Africa, depending on the country. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, churches provide half of all the medical care. And the church is often the center of the community. Where there are no roads, there's frequently a church or a mosque. This is Banganga, an impoverished urban district in Lubambashi. In the entire city of three million, there are more cases of malaria here than in any other neighborhood. Throughout the nation, a bloody civil war left the infrastructure for clean water and sanitation nearly non-existent. The pools of sewage and rotting debris have become a paradise for mosquitoes. But an unprecedented effort is intended to send the petulant pest on the run. <laughs> World Malaria Day 2010, Bonganga, a fresh offensive against the mosquito. A coalition of faith leaders, Christian and Muslim, joined together in a historic launch of this malaria campaign. These are the people who have made it possible for us to be here today, and we want to thank you very, very much. Please give them a big, big round of applause. <laughs> Okay. Anticipating the rollout of Imagine No Malaria, the United Methodist Church partnered with Nets for Life. While funds primarily came from outside Congo, it was a homegrown effort to organize a public health team of door-to-door -door volunteers, most of whom are from the neighborhood. Usini Fare is a Muslim who is proud to be working alongside his Christian neighbors. I'm confident that the program can expand and continue in Congo and throughout Africa, especially if they leave it in the hands of the church and not give it to the government, because the government, they only start things once and they stop. But us, we're the community representing the people. As a mother of 19 children, Kaya Bawili is among the first to receive nets like all mothers here, she fears the fever, the chills, the threat of malaria. It is a disease that worries everyone because it kills. At times, it can strike in the house and you don't have money to get treatment, so you can lose a child in a small time. It is a dangerous disease. The community responds to this approach, which leaves in place trained health workers who continue to provide accountability and follow through. We go into communities, we go into the households, we count the sleeping spaces, we count the people, we determine how many nets will be necessary. 
we go back to see if people are using those nets. If they're not using those nets, we want to know why. Sometimes it's simple superstition that can affect use. One of the myths around the nets is that they cause sterility, that men aren't as fertile, women aren't as fertile. It will cut down on babies. Another, not so much a myth, but a reality of the net, it's hotter sleeping under a bed net. It's not as comfortable. So it is important that people understand the value of the net so that everybody's safe in the community as they sleep at night. 30,000 nets are distributed, and this house-to-house -house approach results in a 20% increase in actual bed net use. If a person doesn't use their bed net and therefore gets sick, they're going to pay a lot more money in getting to a hospital or getting treatment or, in worst case scenarios, losing a child or losing a pregnant woman than the actual dollar value of the net. So now you're talking about comparing values of a $6 net and using it correctly and the value of a life that would be saved. But if you don't invest in making sure communities understand those decision points and those value points, then you're spending a lot of money on nets and transport, and by not spending money on getting the communities involved and understanding their world and that value of the net to them, then you lose, you lose everything. But in many African communities, malaria is still a mystery. Why are people falling ill? Why are they dying? We didn't know. I mean, mosquitoes were just kind of music all night. It's ancestors who come to visit us. Bishop Nkulu Ntanda Ntambo says some believe when the rains come and the mangoes ripen, people fall ill. Others believe the unexplained illness is a result of witchcraft. He experienced this firsthand as a young child. We used to move with my parents from one village to another. You can see the whole village running away, they leave, because of death. It's a cycle that promotes poverty and misunderstanding. Here in Kasumgambi, Congo, Mama Rose Nambing has lost her entire family to malaria. My husband died from malaria. Seven children died from malaria, so I don't have anyone. Rose's neighbors steer clear of her because they say there must be some reason she's suffered this fate, and they don't want any part of it. I don't want anyone else to lose their life to malaria. It is painful when you lose someone from this disease. As she utters this mournful message, children gather alongside a stew of swill that breeds sickness. Malaria will likely kill one in five of these children. There is no clean water as we expected, and this is the only water in this, what we call, how do you call it, the pool? Bishop Ntambo spends much of his time educating his people about how to prevent malaria. And this is the place where we have, it was kind of like mortuary. Children dying here every day. He borrowed money for shovels and instructed workmen to hand dig over 25 miles of overgrown canals. Many didn't even know these ditches were here. They were dug for the Belgians, but when the colonial power left Congo over 60 years ago, malaria found a foothold as the canals choked with sand and vegetation. When Bishop Nantambo suggested they excavate and find the framework of the system, folks said, I was crazy. No one believes me. Some accused me that I was given a lot of money uh, so I can do the job. I said I, didn't, I, was, I wasn't given even money. I used the money from my own pocket. As the incidence of malaria declined, more shovels were put to use. All these houses, when you go in, you will find mosquitoes' nets. And now with the canal, including mosquitoes' nets, many lives are being saved. But it's only part of a larger movement among clergy. 
Pastors and imams are taking this message to the pulpits. Mosquitoes mean malaria, and malaria must be treated by doctors. This is information that is making a difference. Considering that several African countries are emerging from civil war, and there is often perceived corruption at high levels, directives from the government are sometimes viewed with suspicion. But when clergy address the causes and prevention of malaria, their word is truth. They are a part of a legion of warriors fighting to decrease deaths and to prevent malaria. On another front, scientific soldiers are brewing hopeful solutions in laboratories around the globe. Stay tuned to see how. The beauty of Kenya is undeniable. Its abundant wildlife is a showcase of the continent's proud pedigree. Kenya is also considered the economic center of East Africa. But despite its many commanding qualities, the country is not immune to the scourge of malaria. It's estimated that up to 35,000 children younger than five years of age die of malaria every year in Kenya. The Siaya District Hospital is just one of three sites in the country where hope is taking root. Here, researchers say that they are on the verge of a malaria vaccine. Take this plate, put that here, and then we do the striking. Pharmaceutical powerhouse GlaxoSmithKline Biologicals and the PATH Malaria Vaccine Initiative are now in the third phase of drug trials. This is the largest trial ever of a malaria vaccine which is being done in Africa. Uh, for this trial we are enrolling 16,000 children across 11 African sites. This is the last stage of research before a drug is submitted for approval. The vaccine is called RTSS and it was invented 20 years ago, but first had to be researched thoroughly before it could be brought to malaria-prone areas of Africa for testing. When administered to infants and children under the age of five, it's about 50% effective against the most deadly species of the malaria parasite. It has the potential to save many lives. If all goes as planned, the vaccine could be available on a wide scale in about five years. There are some growth, this one is clear. When that happens, the efforts currently going into community empowerment and capacity building through Imagine No Malaria could help in the messaging and distribution of a vaccine. In the meantime, scientists at Johns Hopkins Malaria Research Institute in Baltimore, Maryland are hitting the mosquito right in the gut. Actually, they call it the mid-gut, and it's where the malaria parasite likes to hang out. We started working with bacteria that live inside the mosquito midgut. Let's back up and explain how the mosquito and malaria are connected. This little bugger is simply a very efficient carrier of the malaria-causing parasite. It's the parasite that attacks us, but it's delivered by first-class airmail. Without the mosquito, there is no malaria. Actually, without the female Anopheles mosquito. She has to have a blood meal in order for her eggs to develop people provide the buffet. It looks so insignificant, but it's tremendously lethal. And so the question comes, why can't we get rid of this apparently little weak organism? That's a tall order, because mosquitoes are a moving target. They quickly become resistant to pesticides and other interventions. The mosquito is a very resilient uh, uh, organism. But the parasite within the mosquito is an easier mark. Researchers are introducing a genetically modified bacteria into the mosquito. It keeps the parasite in the mid-gut, never making it out of the mosquito. In theory, the lab could introduce this method in the African environment within the next five to 10 years. 
but there are serious ethical considerations. Playing God, even with microscopic bacteria, is heavy stuff. The aim here of introducing the genetically modified organism in nature is to improve health, and that is a strong motivator. But despite this kind of consideration, there is a lot of resistance, and one needs to show to the regulatory authorities that this approach has no dangers uh, of any sort. The lab breeds about 10,000 insects a week, but they aren't putting all their mosquito eggs in one basket. A variety of tactics are being tested. It's the only way where we will have a world with no malaria is if we integrate all possible approaches. I think it's in our interest to help poor countries who are unable to overcome this problem. And uh, in the long run, I think, if we have more prosperous uh, people around the world, I think we will benefit as well. Up next, going the extra mile in Mozambique. Mozambique, on the southeastern edge of Africa. Kissed by the warm waves of the Indian Ocean. A prime trade route, it caught the eye of the Portuguese Empire in the 16th century, and the people here lived under its rule for nearly 500 years. Now, nearly two decades out of a civil war, economic mismanagement and devastating natural disasters have resulted in more than half of its population living on less than a dollar a day. And malaria is the major health concern in this coastal country. In some areas, 90% of the children are infected with the disease, and more children die from the disease than any other cause. On average, this hospital treats 100 children every day for malaria. But it's not just the little ones who suffer. Well, we have this young girl. And she has symptoms of malaria and she is going to see the doctor now. Malaria curses the purse as well. Like Mozambique, countries rife with malaria are more impoverished. The price is both personal and public. The cost of seeking and getting treatment, the loss in productivity, and the devastation wrought when a family wage earner dies of the disease, all add up to an exhausting economic enemy. We know that malaria is caused by the uh, mosquito bite. Mm. So the question is, can the same type of faith-based, community-run effort launched in Sierra Leone be duplicated here? Certainly, there are thousands of miles of borders between the two countries. But malaria and the church both easily cross those borders. United Methodist Bishop Joaquina Ninyala knows it'll be a lot of work. I'm really looking at this as a movement. I'm anticipating a number of people that will come together regardless of who they are fighting the same cause. Each country has its own challenges and also benefits. Here to begin the implementation of the project is Nyama Dunbar. What we have to do is really try to sell it to them, sell the idea to them and show them Yes, we all want to get the nets out to the people, so we all ultimately have the same goal. But even beyond that, what we really want is to see decreased cases of illnesses and death. The first step? Trying to convince local government and health officials that simply handing out nets won't cut it. The government and the private sector have done their role in bringing the nets to you. It is your responsibility to ensure that it gets to the people that it was meant for and that it's used correctly. 
Many times there is an assumption that money, or nets, will simply be handed over. But this methodology requires accountability, contracts, and most of all, communication. I learned that my name means something very funny in your language. Nyama in Swahili <laughs> means mincemeat. Calling attention to language differences at the onset helps spark understanding. No, I want a Mozambican name for a human. There are so many local languages. So the idea of not only speaking but communicating and making sure there aren't any misunderstanding or assumptions on either side. They know what we expect, we know what they expect. Yesterday we talked about two objectives. Helping to strengthen the governance of local health boards, teaching financial accountability and how to apply and administer grants. It's a model that is mirrored in the church's agricultural programs as well. Here in Kamina, Democratic Republic of Congo, community health workers are learning techniques they will take back to their neighbors. The government depends a lot on the community health workers to go out and be agents of change in their own villages, but often we find that the community health workers are hungry themselves or suffering from malnutrition, so they lose motivation to volunteer their time. So what we're here doing is trying to integrate a farming program that's sustainable for them to feed themselves and their families. When they visit a local farm project, they begin to see the value in sustainable agriculture and development. Leaning on native expertise, these farmers have learned what works and what doesn't. For instance, through integrated crop and pest management training, farmers discover plants that provide natural solutions to insect control, instead of relying on high-cost pesticides that have harmful effects to humans and the environment. We discovered this kind of organic pesticide. Farmer field schools allow participants to learn hands-on. I want to share ideas with all of you for different... Pledging to share knowledge. These are skills that can never be stolen, destroyed by war, or separated from the farmer. It minimizes dependency, maximizes potential, and builds community, much in the same way that the Imagine No Malaria model empowers a grassroots force. Leaders emerge and oftentimes women surface as key managers. <laughs> Old models of missions that center on outside donors doing for communities are not sustainable or even practical. So it's not just about bed nets. Ultimately, it's not even about malaria. It's about leaving in place a structure that will help communities pull themselves out of poverty and toward healthy, productive lives. There is a proverb which says it's better to train someone instead of giving him a fish. While education is happening on this side of the ocean, another form of education and awareness is occurring in the United States. Coming up, what it takes to convince others to join the fight. Malaria, malaria. Although 90% of the world's malaria occurs in sub-Saharan Africa today, she's not doing well. It wasn't too awfully long ago that the United States wagered a gritty battle with the disease. At the dawn of the 20th century, visionaries set their sights on a Central American canal that would link the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. The French began construction on the Panama Canal in earnest. But their machines were no match against malaria. More than 20,000 workers died from the fatal fever. This 1904 magazine illustration depicts the Grim Reaper hovering over the site. It was no exaggeration. With no known prevention, malaria forced France to abandon the project. As their machines were rusting in the jungle, British physician Ronald Ross was onto something. And in 1902, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for linking mosquitoes and malaria. Two years later, the United States took over the canal construction. First step, 
appointing Colonel William Gorgas as Chief Sanitary Officer. Although the mosquito malaria connection was still considered unproven, Gorgas was giving leeway to drain and fill wetlands and disperse insecticides. It can be said that millions of tons of dynamite and nearly just as much bug spray helped dig the 51-mile passage. But malaria was occurring at home, too. In 1925, the U.S. Air Service was using its new invention, aeroplanes, to spread insecticide over mosquito-prone areas in the southern states. And the photographer of this 1939 migrant farm family noted, The entire family, mother, father, and six children, had malaria. When the man was asked if there was much malaria among the people, he replied, Yes, they've always started chilling, and they'll keep a chill until frost, them that don't die. The government formed the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, in 1946 as a primary resource agency to fight malaria in the U.S. The disease was fought on the war front as well. In a wartime cartoon short, Private Safu, a creation of Theodore Dr. Seuss Geisel, demonstrated how not to avoid malaria. He don't care where he goes. He's wide open. Repellent? <laughs> he never touches the stuff. The short was directed by Chuck Jones of Warner Brothers Bugs Bunny fame and featured a vexing vixen. You all know her name, Anopheles Annie. The malaria mosquito. But the menacing message was delivered more seriously, too. Breeding ground for a malignant enemy. This enemy, sighted in the microscope, the Anopheles mosquito, strikes silently behind the lines with a devastating weapon. Malaria. In the tropical climates, malaria decimated Allied fighting forces. A tragic toll of American lives has been taken in the struggle against this insect army in the tropics. During and after the war, a common weapon against malaria was a potent pesticide called DDT. Absorbed through the feet or other parts of the body, DDT affects the nervous system and motor coordination of the insect. Symptoms develop. Restlessness, tremors, convulsions, paralysis, and death. At first, it was thought the insects were its only casualties. DDT was believed to be safe. Contact of the hands upon the dry powder is not dangerous. For in this form, DDT is not absorbed through the skin. But scientists began recording adverse effects on the environment. And there were reported links between the chemical and various cancers. Its widespread use was banned in 1972. By that time, however, DDT had aided in the elimination of malaria in the United States and other parts of the world. Some countries still use it in limited quantities. But in sub-Saharan Africa, the year-round cycle of the mosquito and its resistance to this pesticide simply makes DDT ineffective. And although indoor residual spraying using other pesticides is an important tool, it's only part of the solution. The U.S. was essentially declared free of malaria in 1949. Even so, today, many Americans continue to fight the disease on a global scale. Stay tuned to see how they're doing it. With malaria a faded American memory, the snow-swept suburbs of Ohio seemed an unlikely place to pontificate on the past. It's going to take a comprehensive approach to eliminate malaria in Africa. Um, Rob Naylor is hosting an Imagine No Malaria house party. As education is intensifying in Africa, there is a parallel effort to enlighten U.S. communities by using the same approach, neighbor to neighbor. Said, we, we're starting with malaria because malaria is preventable and beatable, and then we're going to tackle the other diseases of poverty that um, have also plagued Africa for so long. With malaria so far in the rearview mirror, convincing this audience is a challenge. 
it seemed like it was just strictly an African problem and a concern, but I see that other people are taking up the cause. This one is for a full-size bed. It's safe to say that malaria probably wouldn't have been a concern to these families had it not been for two young advocates who had heard about the effects of the disease through their church. Ten-year-old Logan Martins and nine-year-old Molly McNamara have been selling their homemade lemonade for more than three years. They are raising awareness and money to support Imagine No Malaria, and they know all about the disease. People in Africa are having a terrible disease called malaria, and if we donate about $10, we can have a net. We can give them a net. And a net can cover a whole bed for a whole family. And the mosquitoes can't get through the, the net. You'd be scared to be bitten. It would be hard to sleep. By making lemonade out of lemons, this dynamic duo has raised almost $8,000. Molly's motivation is simple. There are kids just like her getting sick. I think it makes them feel pretty good because they know they're special and that's what every kid wants to feel. Hey, nice you. Good night. As they go to bed, knowing they are doing what they can in their community to prevent malaria, there's a single mother in Sierra Leone who is grateful. Nasu Bengali has four children, and she's doing today what she does every day, scraping together enough to eat one meal. Working among her neighbors, it's clear. There isn't any extra here. And when there is a loss, it's felt by everyone. Until Nasu was visited by a community health worker and given information and a bed net, after that, you tug it like this. She didn't know much about malaria. When her children fell ill, she brewed up a home remedy. When the children are feverish, I boil pineapple pills and have them drink the liquid. Ancient remedies are commonly used at the initial onset of malaria, often under the guidance of a traditional healer like Musa Mendi. I use herbs to cure malaria. Just like others in this village, Musa learned about the cause of malaria when volunteers visited the area. They told us that you could not get malaria by getting close to rainwater or washing with cold water, as we previously believed. I now believe malaria is caused by the mosquito. He still believes in the power of traditional medicine. But since the net campaign, many of his neighbors are going to doctors in the local clinic. The herbs are the ones that we've been using even before modern medicine came. So we really can't compare, but we know they are effective. In the city, traditional healers still do a brisk business. And in the market, herbal remedies abound. My name is Musu, Musu Kama. This woman makes her living selling herbs. What's your name? Bang, bang. The bark and roots of a local tree are traditionally used for everything from intestinal worms to toothaches to... This is malaria. When malaria is inside your body, you will soak it and drink it. It is thought to purge the body of the disease. While it may have some medicinal value, physicians warn that some of these local cures can be dangerous. It cannot cure malaria, and at the same time, it is also a problem, you know, causing liver diseases, causing um, kidney diseases in these children. So, in fact, when they give their children um, herbal intoxication, they are not um, treating the malaria, and at the same time, they are causing other problems for their kids. No fear, no fear, no fear, no fear, yeah? You know? Good. Idris Taja treats patients here at the Mercy Hospital in Sierra Leone, and he sees malaria every day. Okay. As does Mbawuri, head nurse in the pediatric ward at the government hospital. It's always filled up. It's always filled up. A three-year-old girl died here just this morning. Other children are very sick 
from the bite of a mosquito. She was unconscious when she came. She came in with um, malaria. And the malaria complications were she was anemic, ghostly anemic, and there was um, jaundice. She was highly jaundiced. Anemia is treated with a blood transfusion and the malaria with medication. But what if a child isn't close to a hospital? What if the hospital doesn't have any medication? Or a supply of healthy blood? Or even needles? It happens every day. But by building a strong health infrastructure, other pressing issues can be addressed. A nimble health system will mean a better life for everyone. Although the nets offer promise, getting them to the people is a complicated process. The reality is in the communities where we do work, people live on less than $1.25 a day. A bed net becomes a precious commodity. The first instinct is to save it, to treasure it, consider it a sign and a symbol of wealth. We open bed nets as we distribute them to encourage people not to just treasure the net, but to use the net. What we hear many times when we go into communities is that these bed net recipients have never received anything newly packaged. Everything they have is something that was passed down. And so if you imagine what it's like to get something new and you own it for the first time, the sense of value or how you want to take care of it or take someone else's because it's so valued is very, very high. When the nets arrive in port, a whole security process unfolds. Once it gets to the district level, there's another challenge of storage and an even greater challenge of security. They're worth lots of money, and so you need to make sure it's protected because we've gone into the community and promised them the nets are coming, so we need to make sure the numbers are protected all the way down to the grassroots level. Nets are delivered by boat, truck, train, cycle, or on foot and local officials have to account for every one. 80% of our budget is simply purchasing the nets and then navigating kind of the infrastructure. There's no roads or we had a train system break down in Congo last year. It's going to delay and increase the cost of just getting the nets to the villages. And inviting faith-based groups to the table is a new experience for most governments. Plus, the church's motives are sometimes viewed suspiciously. We were thinking that we would be the forefront in the planning and the implementation. Then the effects, the ripples go down to the community people. It was Beatrice Cabanga's team that started the process in Sierra Leone. They feel, or maybe they are seeing us as a threat, but we really must not be seen as threats. We are complementing what government is doing. We are complementing implementation of policies building trust, collaborating. These are the positive side effects of engaging local leaders. And nothing happens without their cooperation. I am Chief George Murray, my bedroom. I have a net there. This is to prevent mosquitoes bite. Walking through the corridor to see the room being occupied by my wife. He stays here with some of the children, the little kids, the mosquito net. It is really doing very well for mosquitoes. It prevents them from eating, from sucking the blood of the children and inhabitants of this room. When the welcome mat is planted at the threshold of local chiefdoms, information will be disseminated. Town criers with bullhorns broadcast directives. Meetings are held. Local radio programs are engaged. Volunteers are given access. And yes, nets are secured and accounted for. When people participate in any program, they become empowered. And to show us that they were empowered, then some of them, the chiefdoms, the chiefdom leaders made laws. In the past, nets were used for all kinds of things. But this time, the leaders themselves made laws that whoever misused the nets were going to pay fines. This mosquito net, you know, get one problem, Usa Idi. As a community health worker, 
Henrietta Emmanuel Labour says if outside donors would have tried to do this... They would have found it difficult and chaotic because there is a large demand for nets. So you coming in as a foreign body to do distribution yourself, you're going to be attacked. You might actually distribute all of the net, but it won't go down to people that should actually benefit from the net. Especially when you get to the grassroots rural level, most of them have never had that exchange with a foreigner. So it becomes very distracting keeping them in fixed points at their home so that volunteers can properly document and keep records of who's received and who hasn't received, which is very key when we have to go back to measure whether the nets are still hanging and the impact of malaria cases. As Nasu bathes her children before bed, she will probably never know the effort that has gone into decreasing malaria. Whether it's children selling lemonade, volunteers learning about mosquitoes and bed nets, neighbors opening their hearts and their minds, scientists laboring over microscopic solutions, clergy educating their flocks, or doctors treating patients every day. But their commitment means she worries a bit less. Her children are a little safer because a worldwide community has undertaken an extraordinary effort to deliver bed nets, education, and empowerment with as much care and promise as she gives her own children. That must not be the end. That's just the beginning of a road. And I pray we all continue to do things to save more lives. <laughs> As this family turns in for the night, the mission continues because there's still nearly a whole continent facing a killer in the dark. During this program, it's estimated that 80 children died of malaria. This is a disease that is preventable, treatable, and beatable. With your help, we'll see the end of malaria deaths in our lifetime. To find out more, visit imaginomalaria.org or find us on Facebook. Put it this way, that the mosquito will not enter. Without the mosquitoes, there is no malaria. You have medication for them, then you, you die. You can see the whole village running away because no of food, death. No food, no food. No food, yeah.